Good afternoon. I'm Fran Inman, Chair of the California Transportation Commission. And in honor of International Women's Day, we have to give a big shout out to the ladies of logistics. So let's hear it for the women that help keep goods moving in our state. So um, this is one of my favorite photos uh, last year. The CTC was up at Randy's place, Gomenum, and with a demonstration of some of the latest technology that's available. And because that's a private facility and I don't have a Class C driver's license, that was my one opportunity to actually drive a Class 8 truck. So I would encourage you all to follow my lead because every day really is a freight day. And I'm very fond of reminding my commissioners, my fellow commissioners um, on the commission, that we do really represent the economy in motion. And you know, I think the thing for all of us in the goods movement sector, if we do a good job, we're invisible. Everything magically appears and you know, we're getting more and more spoiled every day with our new Amazon Prime and we can get stuff in two hours. But it does take an awful lot of folks and a lot of cooperation. And also, I would argue there are a lot of opportunities for all of us. So delighted to be here. Uh, when Randy called, and you all, Randy and I were both on the National Freight Advisory Committee, and Randy gave me this big, big promise that he spends at least 25% of his time working on the goods movement sector. So. I'm based in Southern California, so if you see him up here and he's not really focusing on freight, y'all give me a call and I'm going to get after him. But anyway, delighted. We've got a great panel here today to talk to you about some of the innovation and the opportunities uh, that are happening in our goods movement sector. So with that, I'll ask our first panelist to come up. Nate, do you want to come on up? Nate's going to talk to us um, the perspective from the Class 1 railroads. So Nate Kaplan. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner has been great to us and to the freight industry over the years. And my name is Nate Kaplan. I'm the West Coast Director for Go Rail. And as you can see, the title of our presentation is Railroads, Freight Railroads specifically, Leading Technology 200 Years Ago and Leading Technology Today. Now, raise your hand if you flip the switch today and you're up to turn on a light or maybe drove in a car. Raise your hand. Now, raise your hand if you ate food today or maybe put on some clothes. <laughs> All right, hopefully. Right? Well, that means that you depend on freight rail. And like Fran said, if we do it right, it's invisible. And it's something that most people don't think about. But it wasn't always that way. Now, the freight rail industry has been innovating and changing the space of transportation for over 200 years. Now, the story of freight rail is really two stories. It's the stories of the track and it's the story of the locomotives. And we're in a place right now where railroads are getting nearly 500 miles on one gallon of fuel moving one ton of freight. And my Prius doesn't even get that kind of mileage if I had a Prius, which I don't. But if I did, you're not getting 500 miles pulling a ton of freight. But things weren't always this good. Back in the early, in the mid-1800s, the Pope at the time, Pope Pius IX in 1850, declared railroads a tool of the devil. And you weren't allowed to build a railroad in Italy until after he passed away and died. And we got a new Pope who realized that, hey, railroads aren't that bad. And they actually improve our standard of life. Um, the story of the steam locomotive, which started in Great Britain, and really was able to allow us to have an industrial revolution that has given us internet now and cars and now autonomous vehicles. It all started with railroads because before railroads, very few people traveled outside of 30 miles of where they were born. You had farms in cities, right? That means you have cows in cities because you need dairy and people ate dairy. If you have cows in cities, you have cow poop in cities, right? And cow poop isn't really a good thing to have near people. So when railroads were invented and be able to expand, you were able to put farms outside of cities and truck that and move that by freight rail into the city about 30 miles or so, wherever it was located. Um, 
So we've come a long way, and the railroads in the US, and a lot of people don't actually know this, the freight rails are all privately owned companies. In most of Europe and in Asia, it's the federal government that might even own and certainly operate the freight rail system. But in the United States, we have seven what's called class one freight haulers, which are the big boys, the Union Pacifics of the world and BNSF. Those are the two major haulers on the West Coast that are moving things thousands of miles in the most safest and cheapest and most cost-effective way possible. Now, GoRail Go Rail was set up 15 years ago by the Class I railroads and the Association of American Railroads based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we focus a lot on legislation and policies and regulations that are going to impact our industry. There's always these pitch battles going on. They're mostly Goliath versus Goliath. It might be the chemical industry and Dow Chemical versus a railroad or you know, Amazon versus railroads. And so there's always these battles that are going on because there's a lot of money at stake and there's a lot of lives at stake too. So rail, what we do at GoRail is meet with elected officials in every state and in every city in the lower 48. There's me and four other people that cover the entire 48 states here. And we had 2,097 meetings in 2018 alone. But out of the 2,000 meetings, we got about 900 folks to write to their member of Congress and asking them and encouraging them to either support or oppose a piece of legislation, which goes to show the type of work the kind of you know, really pounding the pavement that it takes to get policies in place that are going to be beneficial for our industry. And that kind of mention I made before about Pope Pius IX is kind of a, you know, a foreshadowing to what the autonomous vehicles and passenger vehicles are facing now. There's a lot of misunderstanding and, and lack of knowledge of how the system and how the technology works. And it's an uphill battle to really inform the public and more importantly, inform our policymakers so they understand that this is the future, that it can be safe, and that um, they should support it. Because the railroads were in the same situation 150 years ago. Now, a lot has changed in 150 years. Railroads are extremely tech savvy now. Like I said, we're getting 500 miles a gallon, moving a ton of freight. So we have what it's called tier four locomotives, which are coming online in places like California, which are driving the debate on environmental concerns and making sure that air quality is as clean as possible. Uh, railroads are a major part of that discussion. We emit one quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions of what trucks do, ton for ton. So when we're talking about green in California, or green in the US, freight railroads need to be part of that discussion. We have what's called positive train control, which is installed in all the freight railroads right now which is basically smart train technology. So every train is talking to each other. They're all hooked up to GPS and Wi-Fi. So a Union Pacific train is talking to an Amtrak train, which is talking to an LA Metrolink train, which is talking to BART trains. So human cause error is going to be virtually impossible. And this is a technology that was invented and created because there was a major head-on collision in Chatsworth near Los Angeles. 10 years ago, where about 30 people fortunately died. The LA Metrolink driver was distracted on his phone and he had a head-on collision with the Union Pacific train and it was an enormous national disaster. And Congress said, railroads, figure it out. We don't want to ever see this happen again. So $11 billion spent 10 years later, the freight rail industry invented, built, installed the technology and now has trained all its employees so a human-caused error, something like you saw two years ago, we had a derailment near the Seattle-Tacoma area around uh, Thanksgiving time, you might remember some horrible images. That would have been prevented if positive train control was installed. But the congressional deadline was moved to the December 31st, 2018, just a few weeks ago, and all the railroads have met that. Um, we also have sensors everywhere. Railroads are loaded with sensors. There's sensors, there's wayside detectors that are collecting the data of how fast and where railroads are moving in real time. Um, there's sensors in each little ball bearing in the wheels. So if the wheels are overheating, they're able to detect that in advance to prevent a derailment. 
Now they're using mini trains that shoot ultraviolet, ultrasound detection radar onto the tracks to can pick up any deficiency in the track system. Now they're using like these little mini trains to do that now, but they're testing drones in Colorado, which will be able to fly in front of a train and shoot its infrared radar and detect any deficiency in the track system. Because 99% of the time when there is a train derailment, it's not an issue with the train, it's an issue with the actual track. Okay, that's a good thing to remember. But it's also good to remember that 99.9978%, that's three decimal points, of trains get to where they need to go without an incident. And the US has the safest record in the world, ton per ton, and we actually have the cheapest rates in the world. And that's something that is only done and can really achieve when you have a private system um, with government regulation. So, why freight rail? I mentioned a little bit about the environmental benefits and the impacts of freight rail. It's a very small slice of the pie when it comes to the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are released in the United States every day. And a little tiny bit bigger, but still a small piece of the pie when you're taking into consideration all transportation options. So 2% of all the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming out from our transportation sources derived from freight rail, which is pretty small. In fact, the only thing that's smaller is um, waterborne. Uh, freight travel at this time. And guess what? We're going to start using more and more freight. We're consuming more. Our population is growing. So where's that freight going to go? Is it going to go on our freeways and our highways? I certainly don't hope so because it's already so difficult to get from one place to another. You go to any major West Coast city and traffic is is at a standstill during rush hour. And a lot of that is because we got trucks on the road that are taking up a lot of that space. One train can remove approximately 500 trucks from the freeways. And another important thing we have to remember in this discussion is that railroads pay for all their own maintenance and all their own infrastructure. It comes out to about $26 billion a year is what the freight rail industry spends on private investment, no taxpayer dollars that go into the public, into the, excuse me, the national freight rail network. Um, trucks cover about 80% of the cost they do on damage on our roads and our bridges today. That's according to USDOT at the 80,000 pound interstate limit, 80%. So we, everybody else subsidizes 20% of the trucking industry, which is a dirty little secret that a lot of folks don't know about. Sort of the holy grail of where many of shippers that use trucks want to get to is 91,000 pounds on interstate freeways, which railroads are completely against, um, because at 91,000 pounds, they're only covering 55% of the cost of the damage that they're doing on our roads and our bridges. And we really, this is a serious discussion, not something we really talked about a lot today, but who's paying for all this? Who's paying for the infrastructure? Um, and how, uh, how are we gonna model this user-based uh, system? Because the gas tax hasn't been raised on a federal level since Bill Clinton, all right? And now cars are becoming more efficient. And so what the future looks like it's going to be is less reliance on gas tax and more towards a vehicle mile tax, VMT which uh, AAA uh, supported a pi prog pilot program here in California. Oregon has been running a v VMT, vehicle mile tax program with their freight trucks, um, and has been pretty successful. And now the chairman of the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee comes from Oregon, a guy named Peter DeFazio, Congressman DeFazio now chairs that committee, and he's been driving that message home that VMT is gonna be the future of, um, of just travel in general, not just freight, but all sorts. Now here's a look at what California looks like. We have over 4,828 miles of track in the system here in the state alone. There's 140,000 across miles across the country. And we have two active uh, class one railroads, UP and BNSF, and then there's 23 smaller short lines. And this is what they're moving. Just to give you an idea, 162 million tons of freight are moving through California by rail. And if you were to stop rail movements today for an entire year, 
that means there would be 9 million additional truck trips. So as we're having this discussion about um, freight movement today and um, the future of technology and greenhouse gas emissions and lowering those, always keep in mind this unsung hero that's in the room, which is the freight rail industry, is doing a lot and providing a lot of public benefits that are going on behind the scenes. So thank you. Sometimes it's fun to be the human hook, so there you go. Thank you, Nate, so it's great. So now we're gonna hear from a couple of partners representing another sector of our codependent supply chain. Uh, and we're gonna ask Paul to come talk to us first on the macro side of what's really happening in the trucking industry. So Paul, come on up. Okay, excellent. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Konasevich. I'm Director of Business Development for PACCAR in our Silicon Valley office. Uh, if you don't know PACCAR, we are the maker of Peterbilt, Kenworth, and in Europe, DOF trucks. Uh, we have about 30% of the U.S. Class 8 market, uh, and we've been in the trucking business for a long time. So my presentation will focus on PACCAR's leadership in emerging technologies within the trucking business. There are many emerging technology trends affecting the trucking industry today. Connectivity between trucks, traffic, infrastructure, and the internet continues to expand. There are opportunities to improve vehicle uptime, making use of machine learning and predictive maintenance to provide advanced fleet management. The growth of driver assistance systems brings with it the promise of improved safety for all road users, as well as a reduced driver shortage. Advanced drivetrains, including electric, hydrogen, and hybrids, provide exciting new options for our fleet customers. Ultimately, these advancements are transforming how goods get moved through modern economies. There is a huge amount of data being generated and transmitted between vehicles and infrastructure. This data can include vehicle operating parameters, weather, traffic information, or even logistical information communicated by fleet operators and by our dealers. The availability and management of all of this data offers opportunities for new products, additional revenue sources, additional customer satisfaction, and increased safety and productivity. The latest generation of PACCAR connectivity launched in 2015 with the introduction of DOF Connect in Europe, and in the, in the United States, Peterbilt SmartLink and Kenworth TruckTech Plus. We already have more than 150,000 connected trucks in operation each one of those securely sending real-time data about the truck's operating parameters. That data becomes a cornerstone for the machine learning and predictive maintenance that we use to help with uptime. We will leverage this platform as we introduce new connectivity-based features for our customers. PACCAR has a clearly defined connectivity roadmap. We are expanding the use of business intelligence on our connected trucks, including new analytic tools, expanded data security, and over-the-air updates. We will soon introduce predictive maintenance, which will enable us to put mobile service technicians closer to customer vehicles, giving our customers the best service in the industry. This combined with advanced data analysis will increase uptime for our customers. In future, we will roll out advanced fleet management to convert the large streams of data from our trucks in the field into a fleet dashboard. Machine learning will be implemented to improve vehicle routing in real time and optimize equipment utilization. 
We are also looking to enhance truck autonomy using detailed dynamic mapping of roads, buildings, and infrastructure, as well as real-time vehicle-to-vehicle connections. PACAR has a well-defined roadmap for advanced driver assistance development. In 2017, PACAR launched automatic emergency braking, which reduces the speed of the truck or even brings it to a full stop when it's approaching a slowing or stopped vehicle. We will soon be implementing stop and go, which will control the vehicle in congested traffic. We will also offer lane keeping, which will correct and center the truck on the road, as well as platooning technology, which allows two or more trucks to operate within a short following distance. Looking out a little further, we will implement object detection in which the truck will perceive its environment and make decisions based on what objects are in or approaching the road. We are also planning to implement driver monitoring, which uses sensors in the cab to detect driver distraction. These technologies are the building blocks for the trucks of the future. New business models are expected to, merge, to emerge in trucking with autonomous technology. Social acceptance, along with technical and economic feasibility, will drive the adoption of these technologies. Platooning will offer advanced um, and improved fuel economy. Closed course autonomy in controlled environments such as freights, freight terminals, job sites, or ports will add an additional tool for our customers as well. PACAR is working on auto docking and remote vehicle control, both for closed courses. Applying autonomous technology to on-highway applications could create a business model where drivers would bring trucks to staging areas, and then the trucks would run autonomously between the highway on and off ramps. This is foreshadowing for Johnny, actually. He's coming up next. Achieving autonomous vehicles that can run on both urban inner city routes and on highway routes would provide the most economic benefit, but it's also by far the most complex technical challenge. PACAR is very active in the world of electric and hybrid vehicles. In Europe, DAF is developing parallel hybrid trucks with a 20 mile electric only range as well as a battery electric truck with a 75 mile range. At the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas this January, Kenworth announced a partnership with Toyota on a hydrogen fuel cell model that has a range of 150 miles. That truck is now operating in the port of LA. And finally, Peterbilt is developing several electric truck designs, one for port operations and another for refuse hauling. All of the trucks that you see here today are in operation in the real world today. Much of our advanced technology development is taking place in my office in, in the PACAR Innovation Center that we opened in 2017 in Silicon Valley, shown in the upper left. Uh, that's actually in, uh, in Sunnyvale, just off 237. This facility increases the speed of interaction with technology companies and provides us access to new opportunities. We talk with several hundred startups every year in the mobility space. In the upper right is our new office with capacity for over 50 people. Uh, many startups are interested in mobility and are very excited to work with us, and we have several proof of concept projects running right now. In the lower right is our truck lab with room for four trucks. It's equipped with the tools needed to integrate emerging technologies. And in the lower left is our showcase area with ample room to display product and emerging technologies. I'll also um, add to this that within the Silicon Valley office, we work with almost everybody in the driverless trucking industry in the United States and we sell them trucks. Uh, Johnny, who, who's here from Embark, is one of our customers and partners, uh, and absolutely thrilled to be working with them. So one of the privileges that we have at PACAR is that we are on the front lines of the autonomous trucking world, and we get to be in a lot of um, very close and technical discussions. So uh, really, really happy about that. So 
So just to conclude, PACAR is a leader in developing emerging technologies. In coming years, PACAR will introduce these advanced technologies in order to bring safety and productivity benefits to our customers. We are always looking for cutting edge mobility technology. If you have something to show us, please reach out via our website, PACARinnovation.com. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and it's amazing because we all get free shipping, so thank you all for making that happen. So, as I said, for most of us, we have no clue what's going on uh, in the wonderful world of freight, and while um, Paul was speaking, I was thinking about the electronic uh, driver's logs that are now the law of the land. And so if you think about all of that information, big data we have, definitely. And also if you think about the demands, uh, and I like to describe our sector as really the Clydesdale horses, the workhorses that are doing the heavy lifting. Uh, and when you think about um, all of the energy, and we're talking about the emission reduction and everything. I think it's uh, a real wonderful opportunity. So I'm sure next year, Randy, we're gonna have a little freight shark tank, maybe if we add to this, because I think, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll go for maybe a hundred grand prize or something, you know. Uh, we'll <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. Okay, Johnny, come talk to us about what you're doing. Hello, everybody. We were working off this thing. Um, I'm Johnny Morris. I'm uh, head of public policy from Embark Trucks. We're a company based in San Francisco, California. Uh, I want to thank Fran for, for hosting and moderating, and Randy for the invite, uh, and the fellow panelists. Uh, a lot of good stuff. I know we've, we've hit 3 o'clock, which is the magic uh, nap time uh, biologically for a lot of people. So I won't take offense if. Uh, you want to relax a little bit, but uh, hopefully you pay attention because I think there's some fairly interesting stuff to talk about uh, happening in the truck, face, uh, truck space. Um, so just real quick, I wanted to cover um, just a couple uh, ground truth facts about the trucking industry. So it's a $700 billion industry. Uh, it moves 70% of the freight uh, tonnage in the US. Uh, so this is literally the uh, what I like to call the circulatory system of the American economy. Um, again, you know, if we do our jobs right, as, as Fran said, uh, you don't notice us, but uh, every industry from retail, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, uh, relies on moving things by, via truck. Um, there's also a few interesting things happening in the trucking industry. Uh, for over a decade, there's been uh, something of a driver shortage. Uh, there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of struggle getting new people into the truck driving profession. Uh, right now, the American Trucking Association uh, estimates that there's about a 50,000 driver shortage uh, from what would be ideal today. Um, the average age of a driver is about 10 years older than uh, comparable professions. So you have a lot of people that in the next decade are going to be aging out of driving. Uh, and so when you combine those demographic changes, with uh, the expansion of things like e-commerce that are gonna drive truck freight. Um, the American Trucking Association uh, estimates that you need about 900,000 new drivers uh, in the next 10 years. One of the challenges is you have to be 21 to drive a truck. Most truck drivers have a high school education. You end high school at 18. The time between 18 and 21, people go and do other things. They go into construction, they go into retail, service economy jobs. Uh, the other thing is, Truck driving is a really hard job. Um, a lot of times you're away from home for weeks at a time, uh, and people just are not choosing that or prioritizing that these days. Um, a couple other things I wanted to share about the trucking industry that a lot of people don't necessarily think about, or if you read about the industry uh, in uh, the newspaper, it doesn't necessarily reflect. Uh, truck driving is not a monolith. There are a multitude of different types of trucks, types of uh, freight movement that trucks do. Uh, from truckload to less than truckload uh, to drayage and intermodal operations at rail yards and at ports. Um, and so, you know, all this means is there are a lot of different tools in the, in the freight toolkit to move freight. 
Uh, and I'm going to be talking about one specific model of that today. Uh, and finally, um, you know, not all drivers are created equal. So even when we talk about a driver shortage of 50,000, there's actually an even se more severe shortage of highly qualified safe drivers. Um, so that's a real challenge to the industry. Uh, so at Embark, we're building an automated truck. Uh, and specifically, our core competency is software. We're in the Bay Area. Uh, we're developing the kind of AI brain that would run uh, an automated truck. Right now, these trucks are on the road. Uh, they have drivers in them that are monitoring the road, monitoring the system. But our goal uh, is to have a product that can drive a truck down the road without anybody in it. Uh, so we're not talking about driver assistance. Uh, we're talking about driverless trucks here. Um, that doesn't mean that the truck is going everywhere and doing everything. Uh, so I'm going to get to that. Um, what does the future of freight look like? So here's how we see it. Uh, and this is not only our thought, but there are a lot of other companies in our space that have, that have kind of coalesced around the same model. Uh, it's what we call exit to exit driverless operation. You take a freight uh, movement like this, uh, starting in a factory across the border from El Paso, uh, going to uh, the LA area. Um, right now that might be done by one truck uh, and, a, and driver, maybe two if you have a, a driver that's just coming over the border. Uh, what we'd like to do is put either end, uh, keep it the same, have it be a manual truck with a human driver uh, to do things like go through cities, uh, deal with uh, freight loading and unloading, deal with customer service aspects. Many of the things that drivers do that humans are really good at uh, that are very hard to automate. But that middle portion, the kind of long interstate uh, highway part, uh, that's something that's really, uh, uh, really benefits from automation. Uh, it's the part where the humans get fatigued, they get tired, they get distracted. Um, and it's a relatively constrained environment. So it's actually much easier to automate relative to something like driving on the streets of San Francisco uh, where anything can happen. So we've actually been uh, doing this. So this, is a, uh, this freight movement is actually refrigerators. Uh, many of you might have uh, Frigidaire refrigerators. Uh, so we actually partnered with uh, Electrolux, which is Frigidaire's parent company, uh, and a fleet, uh, national fleet rider. Um, to basically block this out. So the trucks weren't driverless. Uh, there were automated systems that were being monitored by humans. Uh, but basically, we had Ryder uh, pick up the, the uh, trailer from a Frigidaire uh, factory. Uh, the, the human drivers loaded everything, uh, connected everything, took it from the factory to a staging area that was along the interstate, along I-10. Uh, there it met one of our uh, automated tractors. They could swap the trailer uh, to an Embark truck. The Embark truck then takes the, the load onto Interstate 10 uh, and drives it you know, those hundreds of miles uh, automated. Um, so again, there's a driver in it right now as we're testing, as we're developing the system. The idea is that eventually this would be uh, a driverless truck. Uh, and then finally, that process is reversed on the other side. Get some nice footage. There's a lot of beautiful scenery along the I-10. <laughs> um, so what I like to, when I talk about automated trucks, driverless trucks, um, I like to remind people that this is only one tool in the freight toolkit. Uh, there's always the, the person that raises their hand and they say, ah, oh, OK, well, what happens when you're hauling nuclear waste through the mountains in the snowstorm? Uh, and the point is that that's not necessarily a great use case for the tool of truck automation. Uh, it isn't today. Maybe it never will be. Um, but it certainly isn't today. Uh, but you know, normal cargo traveling along interstates, uh, which is a, a very large part of the, of the uh, industry, uh, is something that's good uh, or kind of low-hanging fruit for automation. Uh, so by breaking up a long-haul route into these this automated middle, and then you know, local or regional runs at either end. Um, on the local or regional haul route, you're able to leverage the things that humans are good at. Um, you're able to, to um, shift driver jobs to ones that are closer to home, so they get to sleep in their own bed at night. Um, and they're able to continue to do things that are very hard to automate, the customer interactions. Drivers do a lot more than just drive a truck. Uh, at the same time, when you're automating that middle section, you're able to really use what computers are good at. They don't get distracted. They don't get fatigued. Um, those are oftentimes, those long haul routes are the hardest jobs to fill because they're the ones that require people to be away from home for a long time. 
Um, and then the last thing here is uh, what I like to call trans transformative efficiency. Uh, and so this is where we get to be a little imaginative. So the thing about technology, technological change, is it's always really easy to think about the things that you might lose or the things that might change. It's really hard to imagine the benefits that would accrue. Uh, and I like to say if it, if it was true that technology killed jobs, then we should have about 10 jobs right now in the entire economy compared to where we were 200 years ago. Uh, but that's not the case. So there's a few things that happen with truck automation that a lot of people don't necessarily think about. So one, uh, which I know is really important, especially in California, fuel efficiency and emissions. Uh, the Technology and Maintenance Council, which is the truck industry's kind of uh, technical council that sets best practices for the truck industry. Uh, they're a very data-driven uh, organization. Uh, they've found that human drivers uh, can account for about 35% of fuel efficiency performance. So the difference between your best driver and your worst driver in your fleet uh, for how they're shifting, how they're accelerating, are they smashing the brakes, uh, can account for 35%, which is huge. If you think about uh, how much time and energy is spent eking out another 5% fuel efficiency gains, and then you have a human there that is one of the biggest variables. Um, with an automated truck, you can, you can optimize it around driving a particular route uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, when you break up uh, you know, long haul and short haul routes, you're also able to spec trucks uh, to be more efficient on that particular route. So the, the engine power, uh, the axle configurations, the aerodynamics, uh, you, can, you can make a driverless truck as efficient as possible, specifically on the interstate. You don't have to worry about it operating uh, through cities and things like that. Uh, and finally, automation is powertrain agnostic. So right now we use diesel trucks uh, because that's what's easy to buy. There are plenty of uh, companies out there that are looking to build uh, electronic, electric drivetrains, hybrid drivetrains, natural gas, uh, and automation will work with all of those. Uh, and instead of fuel efficiency, we're talking about range extension for, for automating electric trucks. Uh, and then finally, supply chains. So you know, it's hard to get the average person really excited about automated trucks because they don't really interact with trucks. It doesn't affect their daily life. Uh, but the consumers of freight trucking uh, the retail industry, the agriculture industry, um, you're, all of those things have been built around this hub-to-hub -hub model uh, that's really based on hours of service. Uh, so truck drivers are limited on how long they could drive in a particular day. So if you have uh, two logistics hubs, you basically set the distance based on how, much, how long you can drive in one day. Um, if you have a driverless truck that's able to operate outside of the hours of service constraints, uh, you can move freight across the country in two days instead of in five or six days that it takes now with a human driver. Um, and so if you could do that, you know, how does that change things in the agriculture uh, sector? How does that change things for American manufacturing and, and its uh, international competitiveness uh, when you've cut freight costs and you've increased the, the speed at which it can travel? Um, so I think there are a lot of benefits that uh, you know, won't be clear until the technology is out there, until the shippers uh, the people that have things to move on freight really understand exactly what the benefits will be, uh, but it's exciting. Uh, and then I'll end with this. Uh, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, at, about a month ago, we released some of our statistics uh, for 2018. Um, and so I like, to, uh, I like this comparison. So on the left, you have miles per disengagement uh, that were reported for 2018. Um, and on the right, you have uh, the amount of money that uh, these companies have raised and Waymo's, it's actually kind of hard to, because they're part of Google, so it could be like an order of magnitude larger than that. Um, so basically what this says is we've done a lot with not a lot of money yet. Uh, and I bring this up not to say that, that we're amazing technically, although I like to think we are. Uh, it's not to say that we're really bad at fundraising. Uh, it's just to say that um, the difference between us and all these other companies is we're an on-highway truck automation company. And this really speaks to how well that particular use case fits with vehicle automation. Um, that's how we're able to get such good numbers uh, with relatively short amount of time and relatively short amount of resources. And with that, uh, I will leave it there, but look forward to your questions and thanks for your time. All righty, so I'm gonna <laughs> snow Johnny. Now you're gonna speak for your dad, the other Johnny Morris, and talk to us about Bass Pro and the Bass Pro boats and stuff. <laughs> I can't, I can't get away from, from uh, <laughs> hanging out with Randy without hearing the Bass Pro Shops mentioned. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to wander on over there and we'll talk a little bit. But let's talk. I don't know. Hopefully the mic will follow me. And here we are. We're all live. Yeah, it's great. So scale matters for all of us. You know, I talked about us being really the workhorses. And the opportunities in our market are really, really huge. So how do you all prioritize, pick and choose, where to put your energy, where to go first? I'd say you know, railroads are in a uh, different situation. Um, their horizon, their timeline horizon is not next quarter or next year. It's 50 years, 100 years. Is it going to make sense to make this sort of investment? Because uh, it's very expensive to build and maintain railroad tracks. So um, those decisions are being made individually by each railroad. So Union Pacific is competing with BNSF, which is competing with CSX. And they're all competing for that business. So those are decisions that their business development people are, are making on an individual basis. And it has to pay off 50 years, 100 years from now is really kind of what their mindset is. Well, except that you are. I do know my buddies in the class whale class one rail are using drone technology for the track inspections. Mm -hmm. So while the bigger system perhaps uh, has a much longer useful life and therefore uh, big price tags and, and complicated, but I do think within the rail sector we are seeing a lot of uh, technology applications in the total total operations, but maybe on the uh, trucking side, you all want to talk mm -hmm. about how to prioritize? Sure. So in terms of priorities, um, there's an interesting thing that happens in Silicon Valley is that, you know, a traditional engineer, you say, what are my needs? And then mm -hmm. what are the things that I can bring to meet those needs? But with cutting edge technology, you have things that you never imagined would be possible. And so you can look at those as seeds and then say, what do you do with them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so certainly with autonomous and with the recent advancements in terms of uh, machine learning and computer vision, it's opened up the, the, uh, some light at the end of the tunnel to have a, a commercial business mm -hmm. uh, that could solve a lot of the uh, um, staffing challenges and, and, and other challenges within trucking. And so, um, if you think about it, the, the neat thing about autonomous is that it, it's not often that something this um, big comes along uh, that could be helpful to logistics in so many different ways. And so for us, that's an, an obvious thing for us to jump into. Uh, and this is part of the reason why we support uh, uh, Embark and, and companies like it. So in that regard, we all know we have a huge chassis issue, and most of our images here are looking at you know, the tractor part of the move, but we in the United States have suffered through uh, craziness, I would say, in terms of we were born in the containerization world thinking that we had to match up every chassis with every container. And we put the blue ones with the blue ones, put the green ones with the green ones. And uh, so what we had in the United States is we had ocean carriers really having vertical integration in their business units. Uh, it wasn't their core business. And then, I don't know, maybe five, seven years ago, time flies when you're having fun. But after losing hundreds of millions of dollars of their overall business every year, they took a hard look and said, this is crazy. Why am I in this business? Uh, and we saw it primarily on the East Coast. And that was driven more out of space constraints. I think Norfolk was one of the leaders. And they frankly just didn't have room for all of these chassis storage piles. Um, but what's been difficult for all of us, and particularly in California, is just this inefficiency of really trying to change and be like the rest of the world, which means you have a great interchangeable chassis. Um, but when we went to pass the baton, there really wasn't anybody in the next leg of the relay. So it was difficult. We've had some early pools designed. And we still, I mean, we're here today, and we've seen it most recently with the cargo alliances, which are another response to a challenge 
in the freight sector just from the excess capacity and our ocean carriers having to team up with folks that they never wanted to team up, but now you can send your Maersk cargo on a non-Maersk vessel. Uh, but I see those kind of opportunities <coughs> too, and you know, to a certain extent our ports are, are uh, looking at it, but it's a huge um, opportunity as well as a challenge. I describe our sector as an orchestra with lots of first violins and no conductor. <laughs> and I love to talk about the system of systems. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, in my day job, um, my real full-time day job is in commercial real estate, and we build those big warehouses, and the sweet spot right now are the e-commerce fulfillment centers. So uh, with those buildings, they're typically at least a million square feet, most of them are a million four, and going up from there. Um, clear height, we never broke through the 32-foot ceiling till maybe five years ago, and then all of a sudden now you don't build a building that isn't 40 foot clear. Uh, they're all cross docks, so it's all in one door, out the other <coughs> door. Uh, but I think for all of us looking at how do we solve all of these pieces of the puzzle, not really simultaneously, but we need the whole orchestra, <laughs> I think, yeah. to be able to really play a good song or a good melody. Um, so I guess my question for all of you is really um, how can we really get to scale in terms of really, really make a difference? Yeah, well, I guess what I would add and kind of also to touch on your first question about priorities, uh, we have the luxury of being a startup in a world where there's a lot of incumbents, and like mm -hmm. you said, there, it's a very complicated ecosystem. Um, and so I think one of our advantages is we're able to come uh, without a lot of the responsibilities mm -hmm. of maintaining mm -hmm. a, a current business while trying to innovate. Um, we're trying to do something new. And so our approach, our prioritization has really been um, going after the low-hanging fruit, right? So we could mm -hmm. say, well, we want to build a driverless truck that can go everywhere and do anything, but realistically, you know, you have to prioritize, you have limited mm -hmm. resources, there are things that are very complex and hard. Um, and so that's why we've kind of centered on both the exit to exit model. Uh, and then if you noticed, you know, our, that free route was in the, the Southwest United States, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. is generally a little bit easier environment uh, than say doing something in the Northeast, given the, you know, the weather, the weather and the congestion and things like that. Not my <coughs> polar vortex days. Right, and I would I would argue that not having a conductor is actually a good thing. Mm. It's very yeah. much an American thing, right? We don't have the federal government dictating what we have to do and when we have to do, how much revenue we can earn, and where we have to invest it. That happens in most other developed countries, but in the U.S., we have a tradition of competition and competition driving innovation and getting things cheaper and faster. That's why you know. In the railroad world, in 1910, we had almost twice as many miles of rail network tracks steel in the ground that we do today because you had five or six different companies competing with each other on the same line. And really, over time, the losers left the game and they went bankrupt and the winners are still in it, you know, 100 years later. So not having conductor really, I think, um, does, it, it drives innovation, it drives competition, because when you have the federal government, or any government for that instance, um, telling a business how to run its business, then you're gonna stifle that innovation. Now, when it comes to safety, that's something that the government needs to be involved with, and, and the railroads welcome that. When it comes to hazardous materials, bring it on. We wanna work with the government. But we don't want the government telling us where to invest money, how much we should, and where we should be operating. You know, and in fact, we may see a case study of this because, uh, you know, uh, w one of the competition points for Silicon Valley is China, mm -hmm. and it's very top-down and very closely managed. Mm -hmm. and, and it'll be very interesting for me to see within trucking how well do these Chinese startups do in such a highly structured environment. Uh, because here, you know, uh, Johnny can talk to me or any of my competitors. I can talk to yeah. anybody, and I think that vibrancy is really important as long as we're talking. Yes. And I think maybe that's what you're driving at is we need to have the discussions <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Otherwise, you can end up in, in, in these uh, uh, capsules, right. yeah. not communicating. Right. And the railroads are also, we should say, we, you know, we compete with the trucks, but we love the trucks too. We need them. We're always going to need trucks. No matter if there's railroads, if we doubled the network, we're still going to need first mile, last mile. Trucks yeah. are our biggest uh, client, our biggest customer, as well as our biggest competition. Mm -hmm. So those conversations really need to happen throughout the entire supply chain. Yeah. One of the... Um, one of the interesting aspects of, of our company and companies like ours is you know, we have one foot in the kind of traditional tech uh, mm -hmm. industry in the Bay Area and then one foot in the trucking industry, and those two cultures are very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you, know, you, have, you have a reputation of the tech industry of you, know, you come in, you move fast, you break things. That doesn't fly in, in trucking or, or, frankly, in any safety-critical mm -hmm. industry. And so I think one of the things that uh, all the companies in the space uh, have, have realized to their credit uh, is that you can't innovate in a way that doesn't include all the Everybody incumbents, else. that doesn't include you know, our company working with Paul's company, um, that doesn't include us going and talking to fleets and going and talking to shippers and really understanding, okay, we, we can build this amazing technology, but if we don't think through how to operationalize it, realizing that there's tons of infrastructure mm -hmm. and this very complicated orchestra that's already playing, if you come in with a new instrument and just play your own tune, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> uh, to extend your analogy, so I That'd think- That'd be it, a solo concert. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'd get thrown out of the concert <laughs> is, is what would happen. Yeah, no and so th this is actually very critical for us at PACAR is around the safety point, mm -hmm. is that um, at the end of the day, these are trucks on mm -hmm. the road moving mm -hmm. at high speeds. And so we are super picky about who we will support and who we work with. And, and we're looking for companies like Embark that, that really take that safety seriously and take the engineering uh, and, and the testing very, very seriously because uh, as an industry, we need to get this right. We need to get the innovation mm -hmm. right. Uh, otherwise, we will see governments stepping in in, mm -hmm. in unuseful ways. Right. And so um, uh, we appreciate their care to all of that. Yeah, lives depend on it, literally. Yeah. That's great. Questions from the audience? We can, we'll try to get some microphones. We'll start back here first. Thanks, great discussion. It seems like the timeline for when the technology will be available for passengers and truck and rail is different. Do you think the regulatory regimes will, will also have different timelines? Or will the slowest kind of dictate the timing for everyone. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I hope, I hope that they won't have different timelines. Um, I spend a lot of my time talking to both states and the federal government uh, about that exact issue. Uh, truck automation has gotten a, a slower start. You know, passenger vehicles were kind of the first application mm -hmm. from a research perspective. But, it, uh, you know, I think in the last few years, a lot of people are coming around to the idea that kind of on-highway truck automation, maybe it's not the first, but it'll be a, a fast fo follower. Um, to the kind of you know suburban Waymo. Uh, I think it'll be faster. first, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it'll be first too. Yeah, but uh, just technically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've you've actually seen that reflected in uh, a lot of the regulatory discussions. So uh, AV 3.0, the federal uh, government's guidance on automated vehicles, the the third version of it came out uh, this past fall, and it was actually the first version that included uh, FMCSA, the motor carrier regulators, input. Um, and that guidance essentially uh, created the pathway for driverless trucks to be able to operate uh, in interstate capacities without additional rulemakings. Uh, so if we can build it and we can prove that it's safe, and that's obviously a big question to dig into uh, about proving it, um, there's no kind of specific thing that's holding uh, the automated trucking industry back. Okay, I think we had another question down here. Hello. Oh, microphones. Okay. Hi. Down here. Uh, all day, I can't help but remember that movie, Maximum Overdrive. I don't know if you all remember that one. Um, yeah. Just, just joking. Um, so, so many questions, but I have, I have two. I think for you, Johnny, and the trucking sure. mainly. Um, so, on these long journeys in the Southwest, where there's no driver in the in the truck, how do you coordinate recharging or refueling of that truck? For one and two, how what what is your what are your companies thinking about uh, when you need to convince your clients that their their freight's safe? Um, and assuming these these will these trucks will stop if something gets in their way, you know how do you prevent hijacking of those and the freight and crime, etc.? Sure, good questions. 
Um, there are a lot of operational aspects of specifically driverless operation where you don't have a human around uh, that you know we have a lot of ideas about how we will tackle them, uh, but those are things that we're going to work out in the next few years. Certainly with refueling, um, you might notice on some of our trucks we have additional uh, fuel tanks on them to extend the range. Um, the idea is that you have these transition points that the trucks can pull off into, so you could potentially have uh, you know a person there that can fuel the truck and, and then send it on on its way again. Uh, in terms of the working with the shippers, uh, we've you know when we test our trucks and we're developing the system, we're oftentimes moving real freight for real shippers and getting paid for it. Uh, and the idea being that you know again going to that back to that point, like we can't just build this technology in a vacuum and then say hey it's ready. <laughs> we need to develop these relationships, understand how shippers you know want their freight moved how to work with them uh, you know, as we develop it. And then for the, I get the hijacking question a lot. Um, if someone wants to hijack a truck that has 360 degree cameras all around it, they're, they're welcome to, to try. Uh, but uh, I think it's actually a bigger problem uh, for trucks today where you have you know, people stop at rest stops, they go in, they're taking a shower and, and it's out there in kind of the middle of nowhere. We call them cargo cats. Yeah. Those are the bad guys. Yeah. Steal the cargo, yes. So question here for, to Johnny. Uh, thanks for already answering my uh, question regarding the AV 3.0 policy mm -hmm. thing. And in 2.0, it was not addressed, right? Pardon? In, in AV 2.0, it was not addressed by- Right, there were a couple yeah. lines in there about truck regulation, but they didn't really say right. anything. Right, okay. Yeah. But I've got another question. So now, uh, autonomous trucking is a lot easier, I would say, compared to uh, no, autonomous in San Francisco or any of the regular roads, right, as your disengagement report uh, showed. But how do you think about other cars so who are driving alongside the autonomous uh, truck, mm -hmm. hurdling at 60 miles per hour? And uh, you know, how do they feel about you know, driving? You know, are you, do you have to think about that aspects as well? Uh, yeah, we, so that's a great question. Uh, there's a couple different dimensions. That there's how does, your, how does our truck respond to other drivers on the road, and then there's how other drivers on the road respond to our truck. Um, the, uh, the first part of that is something that we think about all the time. Uh, and so a lot of what are, is in the nuance of developing the system is not just having it you know, drive down the road and stay in its lane, um, but you know, we try, basically all of our drivers, and we, I think at this point I have like maybe seven or eight uh, professional drivers, are drivers that have at least 20 years experience, um, have very clear safety records. And so we try and not just have the truck go down the road, but actually emulate the defensive and safe driving behaviors that they have. Um, of course, if someone decides that they're gonna drive into your vehicle, they're gonna decide that. And whether it's an automated vehicle or a manual vehicle, there's really not a lot you can do um, uh, you know, for that particular case. Uh, in terms of the public acceptance of the technology, um, that's something that, that we're currently thinking about. We're not doing a lot actively because we're still a, you know, a fair ways away from actually having the technology be ready to where it would be operating driverless. Uh, but as we get closer, that's something that we're gonna be looking to do, uh, both directly you know, with public campaigns, working through the federal and state governments to really explain to the public what goes into this technology. You know, there's a lot of, you know, oh, my laptop crashes, so you know, how is the computer on a truck gonna be safe? Um, there's a lot of very specific engineering uh, approaches that you take to you know, safe engineering of vehicle ele electronics. Uh, there are lessons learned from things like the airline industry, uh, redundancies where you know, those simple analogies are very popular but don't necessarily uh, hold. Uh, and so I think you know, explaining, having it not be a black box to the public but actually explaining what it is and how it's gonna make uh, the roads safer is, uh, is a really important part uh, between now and, and when we get to where driverless trucks are on the road. So okay. let's, thank, oh, let's thank this terrific panel for really a great, great presentations and great uh, discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Neil Peterson. I'm executive director of the Transportation Research Board. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the last panel that we have uh, for the day uh, today. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, TRB, uh, we are part of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, we hold an annual meeting every January uh, at which we have over 13,000 attendees. 
And for those of you who are interested, particularly in the topics that we've covered today, we have over 100 sessions. So uh, we invite all of you to come join us next January uh, in Washington, in Washington D.C. So <clears throat> our uh, next panel is entitled Advancing Mobility, Moving Cities Forward. And this panel will explore how cities can move more people without increasing congestion or deteriorating air quality by promoting transit, shared mobility, alternate fuels, embracing technology, and shifting from moving about, uh, moving, shifting from uh, thinking about moving cars to moving uh, people. So we've heard over the course of the day today an awful lot about the technology, where technology is, uh, advances that are occurring in, in technology. What we want to have this panel really focus on is how do we then use that technology to try to achieve some of the broader goals that, that we're trying to achieve uh, from a mobility standpoint in particular, but not just mobility, uh, safety, uh, reducing congestion, reducing emissions, supporting economic and business development, improving accessibility, uh, addressing equity uh, issues as well. Um, and <clears throat> doing it in such a way that we can be encouraging more people to be using other modes other than, than just driving, driving alone. And uh, we have uh, really a terrific panel uh, that to address the issues. So uh, I could go on about this subject myself, but uh, I want to turn it over to the panel at this point. Uh, and our first speaker is David Swallow who is Senior Director of Engineering and Technology for the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. David is responsible for overseeing the design and implementation of many of RTC's projects, including uh, current projects on examining the potential for light rail, management of the public bike sh share system, and integration of mobile technology into the transit system. David. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, this is a, a quote my boss likes to use, technology is the new asphalt. It's one that we are, I think, realizing now uh, more than ever, the ability to eke out a lot more capacity, improve safety, and, and improve mobility altogether through technology. So, uh, Las Vegas, how many uh, have heard of Las Vegas before? Okay. Second question, is it, is it because you went to CES or you saw The Hangover? No, okay. Uh, that's one of those things, is it's a perspective thing for Las Vegas and how we're viewed in the world. But one of the things we should be known for is our willingness to uh, go forward with new initiatives, to try things out. We're okay with failure, too. Uh, we don't like it so much, but we are willing to try things out. And, and this really goes over to the technology realm. And in, in particular, you know, we host the Consumer Electronics Show every year. And in, in the recent years, in particular, autonomous vehicle technology has, has really been permeating CES. And I think it's, it's going to continue to grow that way. And so what we've done locally is to try to enable more testing and things like that. I'm going to walk you through that real quick. I hope. Let's see. There we go. OK. so. Las Vegas, we're home to 2.2 million residents. We welcome 43 million visitors a year. We generally host uh, the same number of people you would for a Super Bowl every weekend in Las Vegas. And so mobility is a key part of the, of the visitor experience and one that we certainly want to make sure it's complementary to a good experience and not a bad one. The Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada is the, the agency I work for, otherwise known as RTC. Uh, we're unique in that we are the transit authority for Southern Nevada. We run the region's only traffic management center. We're the Metropolitan Planning Organization, also the funding agency for streets and highways. And then we're in charge of administering the Sustainable Communities Initiative Plan, you know, focused on more aside from transportation, all uh, aspects of a quality of life in Southern Nevada. And with that, we're able to, regional by our namesake, foster collaboration amongst a number of, of the local jurisdictions, the state DOT, the federal partners, to put forth new bold initiatives. So the three key elements we're focused on in Southern Nevada is safety, 
congestion and capacity. I know that congestion and capacity are, are related to one another, but you know, all of them go together when, it talk, when we talk about transportation. And so, unfortunately, we've been known in recent years for having a, a problem with pedestrian safety. In particular, we saw a 37% rise in pedestrian deaths on some of our valley roadways in one year. That is very sobering, uh, one that we need to uh, get in front of. At the same time, we're trying to enable growth, both of our resident population as well as our visitor community. One of the things we tried out recently and are now expanding it, it's been very successful, is a platform called Waycare. Uh, this is a platform that was developed by an Israeli company, and it was focused on looking at movement, pulling in data, looking at movement, and trying to predict where congestion was going to occur and where there was a high probability of crashes. And with this, we implemented on our, on our first our freeway system to try it out. And so it's basically identifying where the hot spots could be based on historic data, time of day, you know, where the sun is, but also uh, real-time data. I know I think they have a, an interface now with Waze, a number of other uh, partners who are enabling them to consume data and present it and identify key aspects of it. And what we saw in the first year of a pilot program was a 17% reduction in primary crashes because they're telling us where things are going to occur. We're able to deploy mitigation measures to get in front of those. Likewise, we saw a reduction in the response time uh, because we partnered with local law enforcement on this. And then, you know, with some of the more proactive measures, able to get speeds in check on our freeways. I mentioned the pedestrian issue. One of the things we're looking at is pedestrian safety. How do we improve it? Well, first, we've got to know what, what the problems are. And so we're implementing a pilot program to equip a couple intersections, or a few of them, with LIDAR to detect where pedestrians are crossing, to try to understand why they're crossing where they are and not in maybe marked crosswalks, and then to also see how many occurrences of near misses there are with drivers. And with that information, we can start to design mitigation measures around that. Uh, we have four key elements that we're focused on as, as far as bringing technology in. I'll walk you through these. First is intelligent infrastructure and how we create the infrastructure that will enable better communications with vehicles. Uh, one of the first examples of this was a feature that Audi uh, displayed in Las Vegas. Ours was the first city in the country to do that partly because we're a one-stop shop. They don't have to deal with anybody else. They just come to the RTC. We run the region's traffic management center. We're able to do it. They started with a, a function called time to green that's available on the cars to display when the light is going to turn green. That's because we're providing the data to them. They're consuming it and presenting it to their customers. That's being taken to the next level now where it's recommending speeds to help people who are driving their cars know how to hit the green band, so to speak, as much as possible and minimize stops on their journey. Connected vehicles, we're working with a company called Nexar, who has an application to enable vehicles to talk to one another through their application to understand if there's harsh movements, you know, uh, braking, swerving, things like that. Maybe there's debris in the road. Maybe there's uh, a crash up ahead that you can't see physically, but then can com be communicated with you. We're also using it to detect uh, illegal road closures, where we have these random road closures and construction going on. So good partnership with them. Autonomous vehicles. You know, Nevada was the first state in the union to allow autonomous vehicles to operate. We, dis we started with a, a, a shuttle in downtown. There's a company called Aptiv who is partnering with Lyft to provide autonomous vehicle taxi service or ride hailing service. Uh, you would see about 30 of these operating in Las Vegas. They debuted the program last year. To date, they've done about 30,000 trips. I think they got 4.95 stars as a rating there, so it's working pretty well. Uh, also, Enrix, a company we're working with on their AV road rules platform, digitizing the roadway network for them to communicate with auto manufacturers on the conditions of the road, you know, striping, bike lanes, crossings, speeds, things like that, but also a two-way communication to us to understand where there's problems. So if they're having problems seeing the lane markings, 
potholes, things like that. It's being communicated back to the entities. Uh, we displayed or we demonstrated an uh, autonomous vehicle that you see here in the picture. You know, Las Vegas, why have it on a test track when you can put it right in the middle of downtown to test it out? So that's what we did. Uh, we successfully did that for a year. That's now going on to a new grant through uh, USDOT to enable a better connection via AVs to our medical district and downtown. And finally, getting to mobility on demand and really the ability to enable travel without someone ha actually having to own a car. Uh, this, of course, requires a platform. We have a, a mobile application that we debuted a couple years ago. We're enhancing that. We have Masabi on the front end for the payment, transit, transit app on the back end for the trip planning. Uh, we're also a Transit Plus city, so you're getting the multimodal trips, linking transit with rideshare to see those trip options. I think that ultimately is getting to the, the end with mobility on demand and trying to provide that seamless experience. Uh, finally, lastly, one thing that we did was a pilot program with Lyft and uh, local workforces where we couldn't extend transit service to these, to these employers because they're located outside of our service area. But with, with Lyft, uh, we subsidize uh, $1 for each trip for the employees. The employer pays the balance of the cost to help provide that first and last mile connection between the, the six transit routes that go out to the area but are still one and a half to two miles short of getting to where, uh, in this case, Fanatics is located. So it's a good public-private partnership that we're able to debut. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was terrific. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Jimmy Kim. Jimmy is business development lead for Verizon Smart Communities in the US in the Pacific region. He's responsible for go to market and customer engagement to address Internet of Things smart infrastructure requirements for customers in the US West Coast region. Jimmy? <clears throat> Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hopefully, this won't take too long. And uh, uh, we are the, uh, looks like the last stop between uh, you and happy hour. So we'll try to make it brief. Um, so uh, I'm part of the business unit within Verizon called Smart Communities. And um, I think as a technology company, we are really, um, very dialed into technology, right? So when we talk about uh, uh, smart communities and all of the, uh, um, you know, sort of the um, uh, technical standards, um, IoT platforms, and things of that nature, I'm trying to see if I can fast forward this real quick. There we go. So it's really kind of. Um, it's really easy to geek out on this technology, right? Because we're all in the middle of uh, Silicon Valley and uh, the heart, you know, sort of, sort of the, the heart of, of technology innovation. Um, so, you know, we, we get really excited about um, these types of trends. But I think it's also really, really important for us to um, take a step back and realize that, you know, these, there, are, there are priorities out there, right? Um, there are challenges that uh, we're all trying to address as an industry public and private sector around um, rapid ur urbanization, right? So as you all know, these are some stats that are kind of motherhood and apple pie. But um, yeah, people are, are um, rapidly moving into these urban environments. So you talk about 1.3 million people moving to cities every day, right? Uh, cities are going to be the, uh, the big source of uh, CO2 emissions. Um, we've got um, all the problems associated with transportation. Um, you talk about uh, sitting in gridlock for hours on end. Um, you know, in, in, in Vegas, you know, David was talking about uh, all the you know, problems with, this, um, with traffic safety and the fatalities associated with uh, these traffic crashes, right? So these are all the problems that you know, we're passionate about solving with this technology. And I was actually um, talking to a couple of folks at ITS Washington and, and saw the presentation from Roger Miller, mm -hmm. who is the uh, Secretary of uh, Transportation for uh, WashDOT. And I think he quoted a statistic where he had his finance guys say, hey, um, he estim they estimated the 
the dollar amount of infrastructure build out that would be required to have him drive 60 miles per hour whenever he wanted. And it was like some staggering amount, like $115 billion. And that equated to a gas tax increase of about $2.50 for every gallon, right? So we all know that that is not a realistic scenario. And we need to really take a look at how we can apply technology and, um, and data to solve the problems and make do with the infrastructure that we already have, right? Um, and, and people also talk about equitable access, right? This is very, very important. Um, you know, in terms of um, not only digital equity, but uh, making sure that uh, folks from all ranges of uh, income have access to the uh, same transportation choices. So this is one of the reasons why we're actually in this business. And um, obviously, most of you all know uh, that we built our brand around the communications platform, right? So we're the handset guys. We provide the fiber and the communication. Uh, everybody knows that. But um, uh, relatively few people know of the kinds of investments that we've made um, to really kind of climb up that solution stack, right? To, to be able to provide the value-added services um, that address some of those priorities that we talked about in the previous slide. Um, Here's Verizon sort of uh, soup to nuts, um, kind of looking at our overarching business and who we are. Uh, we're a Fortune 500 company. We've got about $126 billion in annual revenue, uh, 161,000 employees. Um, last I checked, uh, we provide the backbone for about 60% of the internet uh, traffic around the world. So uh, obviously, uh, you know, we made some really big investments in communications. Uh, when we talk about the Internet of Things, right, so the data and the technology that actually powers all those sensors that uh, we have on the roadways, uh, we've made some significant investments in this area. Uh, namely, uh, just to um, provide a couple of examples, uh, we've made some strategic acquisitions of a um, telematics platform uh, to the point where now we've got a, a platform with the largest install base of fleet vehicles. Uh, in 2016, we actually acquired a company called Sensity, and they provide an intelligent lighting platform that connects other sensors for smart city expansion. Um, we've complemented uh, that so the data analytics and the, um, uh, the technology around um, IoT with some strategic acquisitions of uh, uh, fairly, fairly, I should say, well-known um, digital media companies. As you can see here, Yahoo and AOL. And uh, where they come into play is they actually bring the data to life, right? So uh, we're already taking about, what we're talking about um, uh, uh, taking that data and um, being able to deliver very personalized, targeted content to consumers as well as our enterprise um, customer segment. And then um, lastly, I want to talk about the next generation 5G network, right? So here, um, you know, the exciting thing about this is that uh, it, um, when it comes to transportation, we're, we're talking about uh, connected and autonomous vehicles and be able to exchange a lot of this information that we collect on the roadways in real time. We're also doing some really cool things with uh, AR, VR, and uh, drone management as well. So that's sort of us in a, a nutshell. Double clicking on sort of the smart community space. Um, so the, the um, area that our group is, is specifically focused on is really a fairly holistic offering um, of solutions. And it begins with the communication fabric, right? So everybody knows the, the work that we're doing around the, um, the fiber build out and uh, the wireless densification. Um, you're familiar with the terms like 4G and, and 5G. On top of that communication fabric, we have um, our, our sensors that collect a lot of the uh, environmental data, right? The, the data that uh, you, know, you collect on the streets, right? What's happening at the intersections? Um, um, arterials congestion, um, traffic data, um, data associated with um, uh, public safety as well, right? So uh, the sensors collect that information and serve it up to applications. And these applications can then now start processing that data and deliver those actionable insights, and in a lot of cases, actually tell you what to do, right? Um, we have a whole portfolio of solutions across multiple verticals and address 
um, a whole slew of different use cases from sustainability to resilience to uh, uh, transportation mobility. Uh, we've got uh, solutions that are focused around uh, parking optimization, um, uh, telematics, as we discussed before, and public safety. And um, we can deliver this um, suite of applications uh, through uh, our own internally developed efforts, uh, where we own our own IP, and also um, through the uh, ecosystem of partners that we have, and we have over about 1,000 of these, right? And uh, they're all sort of um, um, certifying their solutions on our platform. And I think, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a fairly wide assortment of solutions. And then the last sort of piece that we've invested in is really uh, the platform that ties everything together, right? So we have the ability to be able to uh, integrate applications and data to really meet the specific needs of our customers. So I'm going to show take you the video. Take away the people from a city, and you take away the city's heartbeat. At Verizon, we don't just want to help make cities smarter. We want to help make lives better. Let's look at a city's pain points. High crime rates, traffic congestion, aging infrastructure, disadvantaged citizens, the need for innovation and economic development. Verizon is uniquely positioned to provide not just the vertical solutions. Our strategy is a holistic approach to targeted solutions that leverage the full suite of Verizon's capabilities, allowing us to partner with cities and provide uniquely tailored solutions. This means that we can provide solutions to help public safety, like real-time response system and priority and preemption services on the nation's largest and most reliable 4G LTE network. We have mobility solutions that use computer vision, like traffic management, parking optimization, traffic safety, optimized for the next generation wireless networks that can enhance performance technologies like autonomous vehicles, fleet management, and location services. And all of this built on our proven network infrastructure. We can show cities that Verizon has them in their hour of need and all the hours in between. From fiber to wireless to fleet management to smart cities, down to that one call that needs to get through. We're there with comprehensive, effective solutions. Let's build the future together. So I am three minutes over time. Uh, rather than talking about these solutions, I thought I'd, sh I'd play you the video that which brings all this stuff to life. So thank you very much, and hopefully we have time to engage in some discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Our next uh, panelist is Sawyer Hall. He's co-founder and president and CEO of <coughs> Loom. Loom's mission is to provide the most comprehensive and effective commute management system for employers, and we'll hear more about that uh, from Sawyer. And he was telling me more about it uh, before. I think this is really ter terrific what they're doing. Thanks a lot. Neil, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. yep, great. The crowd's dwindling fast, so they're, they're gonna miss out on a great talk here. Make sure this is perfect. Um, I, I just want to start actually on that point. Um, I've just been reflecting on the day because we were challenged to make today great. Um, it's not every day that you do get to step outside of your world and experience, uh, be part of conversations with people who view the world differently, um, view the world from different perspectives, including space, um, hear from people who are pitching their startups to try to get the first $10,000 and be part of um, follow up on a conversation with a multi-billion dollar company. Um, we have to step out of our lanes and today is a great opportunity for us to step out of our lanes. Um, Randy, Marnie, who's in the back, if you haven't met Marnie, um, and the folks here at Bishop Ranch, um, if you don't know the Bishop Ranch story, check that out. They are great examples of, of people and organizations that have stepped out of their lanes because they see a world that's very different. And they've brought people together to get us all thinking um, differently and be exposed to each other. Uh, to that end, you might be wondering what the heck does commute management software and talking about employers have to do with anything that we've covered today. 
Well, that's my goal here is to, by the end of this in the next couple of minutes, uh, to land that with you here. Um, our job at Loom is to, is to help employers serve their mission, not cars. Um, and um, I'm gonna take you through exactly what, what that means and, and, and a little bit about what we're doing. To do that, we're gonna play a little game here. <clears throat> this is Casey, and this really is Casey. She's a nurse um, at a hospital. I want you to put yourself in her shoes, okay? Pretend it's your, your, you just got out of school or you're in transition and you have a new job opportunity and you have five jobs in front of you. Well, um, that's, that's Casey's situation. She has jobs in front of her. She's getting her job offer and, and every employer wants you so, so, so badly, okay? Um, and there's a little hint around you by, by the context here, by this, by this individual. And this is the world around you as well. And you might want to add some electrification there and some autonomous shuttles and things like that that are going around. Okay, so uh, the person who is, uh, who's offering her job, um, she goes to seven different employers, okay? I'm gonna show you seven different examples of her commute benefit. She's been, been given a, the whole package. What's the total package? Here's the first one she gets. You ready for this? That's it, there's no built. That's her commute benefit. You're supposed to laugh a little bit. <laughs> there's, there's, <laughs> there is no commute benefit, you're on your own. And I kid you not, these aren't, these aren't silly examples. I've called big multinational companies in, I'll say, Boston, because that's where I uh, hail from and I live in Seattle now, and I had some connections at a large financial institution there. They're like, I totally get what you do, but we actually don't care how our employees get to work. The next one's called uh, the blind side. You get free parking, Casey. The reason it's called the blind side is because those employers that are offering free parking, little do they realize what's coming. If, there, if, I, if there's any of those politicians folks from this morning, uh, if you have somebody in your area who's growing, uh, building a parking garage, please talk to me. That's my goal is to not have you have to build a parking garage as an employer. But that's what's creeping up on these, these employers. Free parking, pretty good, might take that. <clears throat> this next one is probably one of the most common ones, and we call it the pensioner. The pensioner is like, that's what's predated the 401k. It's your defined benefit, you had a pension, there aren't too many of those around. Well, the tax, the tax laws in the 90s are what allowed for you to get a pre-tax transit benefit or to get pre-tax parking, and there's awesome work done by TMAs TMAs will get money, transportation management associations, and offer things like a carpool um, offering. You go to dig deep uh, with these employers, and they really are only addressing a very, very, very small percentage of, of employees who, who, um, who are taking advantage of that. So that's the third one. Pretty good, pretty good. This is the beer fund. <laughs> now we're talking, okay? A lot of employers think this is the most flexible, the coolest thing. The beer fund is, you know what we're gonna do? Every month, here's the deal, we're gonna give you 100 bucks. Goes right to your paycheck, do whatever you want to with it, but it's for your, to cover your commute costs. You can think where that goes. That's why it's called the beer fund. The catch 22, this is actually a really common one too. The catch 22 is every month or every year you're locking yourself in. You either have to sign up for parking and, oh, we'll give you a parking benefit, a parking subsidy, or you have to lock yourself into a transit pass. So you can get subsidized one or the other, but you can't get both. So that's number five. This next one, I hope I don't offend people. You ready for it? In this room, because this is a, a local, it's a, it's a little pun on the local community. The California Rickroll. The Calif you have to like think about this one a little bit. Free parking. Okay, corporate shuttle from San Francisco and valet parking. Do you know how much they're paying per car for uh, valet parking every day? If you go down to South Bay and go to some of those parking lots, they're like triple stacked. There is so much parking there. So they think they're solving the problem of commute, but really it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Thus the, the name here. And then, yes, this is a little bit self-promoting, but it is really what's happening, and we gave it a, a, a name, um, the perfect weave, um, AKA the loomer. The perfect weave is the employer that is actually very progressive in thinking about complete flexibility for employees, 
Everything is a daily choice for the employee. They're really being mindful of all the different options that are out there, um, including what's coming down the pike. And they're saying, look, we are actually going to charge you for parking. It's a daily charge. But if you choose to not park, we're going to give you all different types of benefits. Um, and that's what, um, what is an increasing list of, of things that they, they might choose to subsidize. You need a platform to do that. Actually, I know it's almost time. This is my non-scientific qualification of what's going on here. Employee delight and asset optimization with your shuttle, with your parking, lower drive alone rate, lower parking demand. Um, up and to the right, that's where we're headed. Not many employers are doing it, but that's the world that we're living in. You can um, think what, uh, what um, organization case you went with. Seattle Children's Hospital, there's a lot of case studies out on what they're doing. Um, two more slides and I'm done. Business imperative, commute benefit policy innovation, and embracing technology, that's what these employers are doing. And we are the technology layer behind that. Um, love to talk to folks afterwards or later about a demo and exactly what our software is doing, but we're a data platform. We're sucking in all the data uh, from all the different um, uh, modes that uh, individual are taking. We know who the individual is, and we have that conversation with them, encouraging them to take alternatives with incentives and disincentives. It works. We have demonstration of employers reducing drive alone rate among their thousands of employees in quick amount of time. Um, and at, in Washington State, in the Puget Sound region, we have over 250,000 employees on the Loom platform. Um, we're able to actually make a, a giant impact in working with the city, with Bellevue, and with other cities around the country. So that is, uh, that's it, and love to get into the the panel conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That was terrific. <clears throat> I think we need you in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> Our next panelist is uh, Hugo Fizzati who is head of business at AutoX. AutoX is a San Jose company creating self-driving car technology for location-based platforms. He leads the team responsible for business development and AV policy and government relations. <clears throat> All right, well, since we have this up, we'll have Ali go next. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Hugo. No, no, no problem. <laughs> Ali Mor Mor uh, Mortazavi is Senior Manager for the Intelligent Autonomous Driving Team for Nissan Motor Corporation. He has a long introduction, but I think uh, given time, we'll just have him come up. All right, I don't know. Can you hear me? Well, OK. Um, so since I'm the, the one of the last layers to your happy hour, I'm going to kind of cut everything and be very brief and short. Um, so one of the, um, let's start with who we are. We are a, a team in Silicon Valley office from Nissan and now Alliance. We are working on a fully driverless, a driverless car um, on the software stack. And we're aiming the uh, future, like five years from now, even not le level four. And, and our approach uh, is uh, to fix the bigger problem that we see for urban um, driving. Um, I'm going to skip some of the slide, but um, what I would like to uh, talk about is like how, what is our vision about uh, autonomous vehicle and what are the challenges and how we see the, pro uh, the problem. So definitely it was a fiction, but now it's a reality. We're all asking about when, how, and, and I want to talk a little bit about how. So um, everyone's talking about uh, autonomous, is car, uh, autonomous car is coming. Uh, everyone is talking about 20, 20 something. And, and, but, but the question is what this autonomy uh, would look like. And that is the big question. And that's what we're looking into um, uh, in Silicon Valley office. So we believe in human-like autonomy, which, uh, which is uh, we believe that the car uh, should, should be, uh, the decision making should be similar to uh, the way that we as human uh, would make the decisions. Why? Because if you're not like that, then we're going to have a lot of issues with the driving, and people would be fed up. Uh, or uh, if you have a blend of uh, non-autonomous car and autonomous car, that uh, creates a chaos. So we see it from two perspectives. One is how you make human-like decisions when you're driving a car. 
Um, so you're an intersection, and um, you always like um, there is there are some rules. People are piggybacking if this lane is blocked, so I can go. You know that person goes on the intersection. So there are many things that also uh, uh, depends on the culture as well. So that's one quick uh, big question. The other one is there are many edge cases, very complicated uh, uh, cases that we as human being can can uh, make the decisions, but uh, the the AI might not be able to. So it's really hard for, uh, for the AI to do it. So this is one of the examples of like the complexity. Look, look look at this person is trying to pass, and she stops the guy and the and the try to turn right. There is uh, like a confusion, the car stops, um, the, there's, there's some, some sort of communication happens and they go. And now see these two cars, uh, this, one, this guy uh, see the opportunity and then cross. And then these people are crossing. Um, so so um, there are like, again, interaction between people. And that is uh, what we're uh, thinking about. That that is what making uh, this driving really hard. The uh, communication between a uh, human and machine and also how we make, we adapt ourselves to the norms and cultures and things like that to make that this driving, um, we call it human-like. This is the, uh, so to next um, uh, topic, this is an example of an edge case. It's actually um, right in, I, I believe, um, in Silicon Valley uh, close to our office. Um, so as you see, if you're an autonomous driver and you get into this situation, you see um, the traffic light is red. You have to go to another uh, lane, which is completely kind of like marked. And then you have to cross the red light. And there is, by the way, there is someone like standing right in the middle of the road. So it's very hard for the AI to make those, um, uh, to, uh, to kind of like decide what, what it needs to do. And, and that is why we're saying there is, um, uh, I would say, a, a role for human to be in the loop for these cases. So NASA is doing a lot of research. They're sending robots to uh, you know, outer space. And, and the big thing that they have is they always have a human in the loop. And that is the philosophy is actually um, that we are following, that um, uh, we, we try to uh, create an environment that the robot acts, that the car drives, but at the end, uh, there is a human. And if the robot cannot make any decision, then um, you know, the human can intervene and help the robot to make the right decision. Something like uh, the mobility control center, uh, you know, what you see um, um, you know, uh, for air, air traffic control. So um, I'm going to skip uh, this side. Um, so we, we introduced the concept of seamless of, uh, autonomous mobility, which the whole idea, is, as I said, is having some sort of mobility manager. You have a fleet of autonomous vehicles, and this mobility manager can in interact with autonomous vehicle uh, remotely. And this is one of the exa uh, examples that we uh, demonstrated at CES, and I will just want to show you here. Uh, this technology has, is, has evolved a lot, and then uh, our capability to also managing a, a work zones also improved, but this is an old one, the one that I can show you in, in public. So, um, so this is a, a real case that um, th this is a, our autonomous vehicle. Also, also, there is a driver over there that's a safety driver. So they, the car gets into the uh, work zone. It cannot operate because it's completely blocked. So, so what happens is it sends a kind of like an SOS message to the mobility center that I showed, and it requests for help that it says, I cannot handle this situation. So the mobility manager tries to intervene and quickly try to uh, guide the, uh, the car. It's not a remote driving with the steering or braking. It's just, just letting the car to make the right decision, saying that going around, this is an empty area. You can go to the opposite lane. This is the path to take, and, and then checking every everything uh, around. Uh, kind of being uh, aware of um, situation, and then um, ask the car to um, uh, execute uh, the uh, the command. So this is the software. So this is actually the uh, you know actual car driving. You see the car is getting to a, a work zone. It sends the kind of SOS. It says I need help, and then suddenly uh, over there the 3D image uh, pops up. Uh, so it's actually the real-time data that you're getting from LiDAR and cameras. And then uh, the mobility manager assesses the system. It sees, oh, there is a work zone. Someone says slow. It kind of paints the path around the, the, the problem, although it's, it's going to the opposite lane, which car normally doesn't do. And then, you, and then uh, after evaluating, uh, zooming in, what is going on? Um, so it sends um, the command to the car that you're safe to go, and you go. By the way. Uh, during this process, 
once this uh, car starts to uh, drive, it is fully autonomous. If someone jumps in front of the car, you know, still the car is uh, uh, fully in charge and control. Uh, and then once it's done, the car continues uh, going its, its path. Um, so this is um, kind of like what we see um, um, envisioning uh, the way that we work. And this is, by the way, at the end, um, the mobility manager uh, kind of um, uh, record what is going on, but our vision is this is like an experience that the cloud in AI can learn. So, so once this has been done and then completed, then um, you know by learning for all these experience from here and there, the AI can manage more and more complicated uh, scenarios, and that can go to the car. Uh, so, so there will be a less and less a need for uh, mobility managers in future. All right, so I'll, I'm on time. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we'll have Hugo come up. Thank you. Still waiting for some slides to come up. I don't, I don't know them that well. To, oh, they see. Okay. There we are. So we talked about um, Las Vegas earlier. So that that's that's our company in, in Las Vegas. I thought I'd open open with that. But um, we. Uh, my, my name is hi everyone. My name is Hugo Fazzati. Um, I'm the head of business at a company called AutoX. Uh, we enable L4, uh, level four uh, autonomy. So, um, and, and before that was our, our fleet uh, or, or earlier. But I think everybody knows um, everybody knows these these charts here. But for those for those of you who may not, um, these are projected trend of labor shortage around the world. Uh, Europe's not on here, but but it's actually it's actually worse, and I'll get into that uh, shortly on why on why that matters. Um, so when it comes to delivery, um, about forty percent of people they say that they have to have the option to have their goods delivered. Maybe that you know it, that could be their shoes, their food, whatever it is, um, in whatever vertical. Um, 40% need to have delivery. Uh, one in every five consumers said they will switch retailers or they will change wherever they're shopping if they don't have um, the option to get their goods delivered. Um, by 2040, shopping trips will are, are projected to decline by 50%. These are not our numbers. These are according to uh, folks much smarter than us at Capgemini and McKinsey and so forth, um, mall traffic is, is already declining 5% year over year. And last, uh, uh, last year, there were over 7,000 bankruptcies in the brick and mortar uh, retail space. So um, affordable delivery means autonomous delivery. And um, once you have affordable delivery, that will translate into one and a half to three times more purchases. So retailers love it. Um, and then on top of that, if the people are happy with the, their experience of the delivery, they will actually buy 14% more um, every time they go and shop. So what did we do? We launched uh, the world's first autonomous delivery platform. Um, in San Jose, we're, we're delivering, uh, this was uh, uh, September last year, and we're delivering to three zip codes around our office. Um, we've partnered with several restaurants um, and also uh, retailers around the area. And this is our vehicle. 
Um, we've, we've, we've tackled the first kind of vertical for, for grocery. That's why you see the grocery bag, but um, there are several other, you know, this applies to obviously all endless uh, levels, uh, uh, areas, uh, uh, um, and industries. Um, you know, autonomous delivery costs will actually be around 40% cheaper um, than other modes. So internal combustion engine, you know, EVs, and, and, and uh, sort of level two-ish partially autonomous EVs. So massive, massive, um, you know, uh, cost savings. And um, since I'm the last one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed this up, but I think this is a, this is a pretty cool uh, video and you can see our technology actually working, a little bit of accidental marketing, but um, again, to carry on with the theme of, of Vegas, uh, this, this was, uh, this was uh, one of uh, a reporter in our car in Vegas in CES earlier this year. Uh, supposed to be some fun. Tomorrow, but oh. We are actually getting a sneak peek at some of the high-tech gadgets and gears, including a self-driving delivery car. NBC4's McCullough Medina live in Las Vegas for us. And Mac, tell us about the close call you had. Yeah, we did. We nearly got hit by a red light runner while we were inside that car. But as you'll see, the technology worked and the car stopped just in the nick of time. A true testament to the hard work of the company's CEO, who was a former robotics teacher over at Princeton, better known as Professor X. Wow, somebody rung the line. Just look at my face as I brace for what is certain impact, a crash. For our cameras following, you can see it is a very close call as that red light runner zooms through. From inside the car, look at the steering wheel. It jerks there, and the car stops as that red light runner barrels through the intersection, zooming past us just a couple of inches away. This car actually prevented an accident. We started our ride in Auto X just a short time before. CEO Jingsheng Shiu, better known as Professor X from his teaching days at Princeton, riding as a safety driver in one of his autonomous cars designed for delivering food. The autonomous delivery is a very useful uh, application for self-driving car. Well, you get you get the point, but um, uh, yeah, just just uh, uh, it was really cool to kind of see that happen uh, live in Vegas. But um, anyway, quick facts about our company: we were founded in 2016. We've raised over 40 million so far. Um, we have about 100 of us, uh, people from, from uh, all top universities, uh, scientists working on, on the full stack, perception planning and, and control. Um, we were one of the first companies to get our AV uh, test, uh, testing permit in California. And um, we're now uh, testing in, in several states. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, this is us. Um, that's it, thank you. <laughs> Come on up. We have about five minutes for questions. So um, let's see if we have any in the audience. Oh, thank you. Over here, can we bring the microphone over? Don't want you to stand there. Please. I'll stand. Go for it. Go ahead and say your question as loud as you can. Yeah, I'm going to steal that one. Yep. <laughs> no, that's that's a great question. Um, so uh, you know, there's there's we've done a lot of thinking about this, and there's a there's a large subset of people, um, not like you, of course, um, uh, that 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 are actually happy to pay uh, very little for delivery and and just have to, uh, you know, not be so lazy and come outside of there. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but 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 there there clearly is. Um, uh, there, there, <laughs> There, there clearly is uh, a two, you know, there, there's kind of a solution for everything. There's going to be clearly the people that want the white glove, you know, service um, that, you know, to bring the groceries onto their counter, like, you know, like, like you were saying. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we haven't solved that yet, um, but, but we are working on something for that. So, yeah. One more question. Yeah. Question for Ali. So uh, why wouldn't you simply use teleoperations instead of uh, the scheme you showed? 
It was totally operation what I showed. Is that teleoperation? Yeah, it was teleoperation, yeah. Okay, but it's not remote control, right? It, it is, for, so uh, remote control, it's not a steering control or someone like sitting uh, like a, with a joystick and controlling the car. Uh, our definition of uh, teleoperation is actually helping the car to do the path planning around the obstacle. Um, so mm -hmm. you do define the path around, or we paint the path around the car. So it also helps the decision making, like uh, you know whether it should go around or not. That's the one one thing, and the other one is just creating a path around the objects, and, and then adding more complexity where to stop, how to do it, and and for us this is called teleoperation. Um, so it's not the uh, someone controlling the car remotely like a steering and gas pedal. Why do you choose this method? Because uh, because of the, um, the the problem with the delay, just assume that you now you have a network of all these autonomous cars. Even with this, there is an issue with like um, sending the uh, messages. So so we need to be tolerant to the delays uh, in the car. So so you can paint, you can send the message to the car, and if the car receives it in few seconds and then e execute, it would be fine because this, the car is still autonomous. But if you're driving it uh, with um, uh, like joystick or steering remotely, you always have the issue. I know other companies, they're trying to address that, but they're always like doing a lot of scanning that how the network is, how to optimize it. And we thought that um, we start with this um, simpler choice um, to, to control the car. Yeah. Here. So I have a question for uh, the Verizon gentleman. So we, we've done a lot of research uh, in pricing models for IoT applications for the products that we develop and for the customers that work with us. And uh, one of the things that we found in the IoT space is both at Verizon and at T-Mobile and at and and other companies is a lot of the IoT applications are really anticipating low volume types of data bits with the, under the assumption that the pricing works on a, on a megabit basis. When what we're finding is when the types of data traffic that comes through on these mobility applications and transportation solutions, we're talking really more in the megabits, which because of that fact, we found it cheaper to not try and get IoT plans out of Verizon or the other companies that we go with standard type data plans because the solutions don't fit our market space. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what type of pricing models you're looking at or what you've been researching to make sure that Verizon IoT applications specifically fit the transportation space. So I guess the question here is that um, you're looking for like a scalable uh, pricing model, right, based on the use case. Yeah, no, this is uh, definitely something that, uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time in. And, uh, you know, uh, to be honest with you, right, it depends on the use case, right, because the bandwidth requirements of like a lighting control application, <coughs> right, are completely different from like a public safety application, which demands a lot more bandwidth, right? So. Um, I think um, the first order of business here is to really sort of uh, group the technologies to fit the use case. And um, so this is one of the reasons why we are um, investing in uh, technologies like CAD M1, for example, right, Where, which is really designed for um, uh, low energy, low, you know, low bandwidth type applications that where we can um, price those uh, services accordingly as well, right? But then there are those other solutions that require the, the higher bandwidth. And uh, truth be told, we're actually relying on the next generation network, um, such as 5G, to be able to provide that kind of scalable access, right? We don't have all of the sort of the parameters figured out in terms of um, you know, all the sort of the high bandwidth use cases. But um, you know, what we try to do is, is to minimize the cost um, on, you know, for our, our customers to, to make sure that uh, you know, we can give them data plans that they can afford, right? And um, where it makes sense, we try to uh, minimize the, the, the bandwidth consumption by be, being able to do a lot of the stuff at the edge, right? So we're actually analyzing, we're doing um, uh, a lot of that uh, data analytics on the device such that uh, we can minimize the, the amount of data that's actually being uh, pulled back, right? So. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, again, you know, there's uh, there's such a wide range of, of use cases out there, and the bandwidth requirements are, are so different that uh, it really depends on the particular use case and the solution. We'll let the two of you continue this conversation. Randy told us before that his uh, performance measure is on time, and it's on time. So let's give the panelists a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.
Be before I cede the floor to Randy, I just want to say, <clears throat> being responsible for organizing a very, very large conference, I just want to give my compliments to Randy and to the entire team at Contra Costa uh, County for a, a terrific job in organizing this conference. Congratulations. Thank you, Neil. So we're going to, well, let's get the, I know you all stayed here to find out who won. Who won the $10,000 prize? So I'm going to call up the judges and come on up. And I've, I've got an envelope. Well, it's not really an envelope, but it's a sealed piece of paper. I can't see it, but apparently the winner is in here. Habib, is the rest of the judges available? Has this been sanctioned by the Price Waterhouse? Microphone because I'm not mic'd up. All right, you guys are ready. You have any favorite among five? I'm gonna open up this one. Oh God, it's harder than I can see. Oh my God, look at this, yo. <laughs> Anybody can guess? Any favorite in the audience? Going once, going twice. The Wieneries Rat Reports. So, come, come up there. Just take a picture of it, they'll deposit it at your bank, no problem. <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, I'd like to, to thank this, the speakers. I know you, some of you came from a long way, and uh, it's kind of cold in here, but I thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules. The audience, thank you for coming today. Hopefully you found this of some value. We're trying to kind of open your eyes to some of the different technologies and the progress that we're making around the world. And the sponsors are very, very important to us. So thank you again to all the sponsors for, for today. We are going to post all the presentations and the pictures online within the next couple of days. So you'll have access to that information. There's been a lot of information. I know we try to cram a lot of uh, information into a very short period of time. So take a look at some of those presentations. There's a lot of value in there. 
Special thanks to Lindsay Willis. Lindsay's back, and she's just, just a fantastic. <laughs> Marnie Primer, uh, Civic, Civic Edge. <laughs> AMG, Fifi, Jahan. And Q, Q Chen for setting up that fantastic safety panel. Safety is our top priority. We always have to focus in on safety. Sometimes it's cool to have all these gizmos and things running around and we're testing these things, but a lot of many, most of the time, if not all the time, it's all focused in on the safety, safety issue and efficiency. So you're getting more out of the existing infrastructure. So that's all we have for, for am I forgetting anything, Lindsay? No, I'm good? Okay, well, thank you all for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there's value. And we look forward to seeing you next year. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.